Well, I'd like to welcome Britt Elders to our uh, Saturday morning chat. Uh, Britt has been a friend for a long time. Uh, she and Anne were friends, and Anne and Shirley, Britt, who is Britt has worked for Shirley McLean for many, many years, uh, were friends. And I was friends with Shirley too, but I think it was mostly Shirley and Anne. <laughs> and uh, they, they really, they really, I remember some marvelous evenings. Uh, at a little at a restaurant up on in Malibu called Jeffrey's, which overlooks the ocean. And I would sit out there and listen to Anne and Shirley talking about the difference in the significance of the light in the dark as the sun set over the Pacific. They're very wonderful memories. Anyway, Britt, I want to welcome you. Britt has oh, thank you. Uh, produced a new edition of the immortal book on Billy Meyer and the Billy Meyer case. She is one of the very first uh, researchers. And, uh, you know, what I would like to do, Britt, to start mm -hmm. is if you would, we, we touched on this, but not enough, I don't think, in the interview that we did. Uh, and that is the issue of the models that were found by Billy Meyer that some of the UFO people made such a production of. And that I felt like from beginning what was a, some kind of a, an, I don't know what, I don't even, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so I won't say what I, I think they were. Anyway, okay. go ahead. Okay. What happened was about midway through our investigation, we decided we needed to have a model built. And that way we could analyze it with the same photogrammetric techniques we were using on Myers photographs. So we did. We brought in Wally Gentleman, who was an Academy Award winning special effects guy that specialized primarily in miniatures. And he built us a little model. We photographed it. When we ran it through the computer, we had <laughs> two very different objects because once the object is digitized into the computer, you can actually determine how big it is based on the pixels in the edges of the object. Meyer's object was 21 feet in diameter. Our little model indicated it was about 12 inches in diameter. So we did all of that analysis. We ran it through all the same programs. It was definitely a model. We were using it to determine for sure, was this a model that somebody had hung on a string? Well, when you hang a model on a string and you digitize a picture, you see the string actually supporting the model hanging. Um, so that was where the model came from. When we left after filming all of that and doing the analysis on it, we gave the model to Billy. And so Billy had that model. Oh, this was back in 82, I believe. And we gave it to him then. But we never saw any sign of models. When we first got there, Billy gave us full reign over his house, his property, and everything on it. And we looked everywhere. We never found a model or anything that was indicative of creating a model, of suspending a model, especially at these locations. And we traveled to all of the locations where he had taken photographs. It would have been pretty difficult to suspend a big model off the side of a cliff. And very often that's where he was taking photographs. And yet, uh, the UFO community really did a number on yeah. Billy over those models. And I thought to myself at the time, who are these people really? And now, of course, I know that there are lots of connections between the intelligence community and what looks like the UFO community. Mm -hmm. uh, the old old line researchers, a lot of them especially, are have connections that they don't speak of, uh, right. or at least not publicly. And I found out about some of those connections and also discovered that some of the people involved in the debunking of Billy using the models as the as the explanation had those connections. So this was a this was like the it was, I relate it to the attempt to debunk crop circles, right. which 
you know, with uh, which the clumsy idi idiotic effort, but it was taken up by the usual sort of suspects, the New York Times, NPR, et cetera, and so forth. And uh, the crop circle mystery was laughed off the stage mm -hmm. by Doug and Dave. And the Billy Meyer case had its its energy sucked out of it by that controversy. That's very I true. Disinformation is a big problem with this subject, especially when there's evidence. It's mm -hmm. It's unfortunate because it never gets out to the public where it needs to be because there is so much disinformation and manipulation of ideas and concepts. Well, okay, if it wasn't a model, then it was superimposed. That's one thing, but you really need a special effects person to do that superimposition. At that time, back in 1975, we didn't have Photoshop. We didn't have cameras that could take video and, and movie footage. It was done with 35 millimeter cameras and eight millimeter in Billy's case, uh, film footage. There was no way unless he hired a specialist to come in and superimpose it, that it could be that good and that clean. And you would still be able to detect it when you ran it through the photogrammetric analysis. Well, exactly. So that's where we stand. And yet the case, if you ask the average person who has any memory of it, they think, oh, yeah, that's the case where the guy had those models. Right. And it's it's tragic. It's tragic. The the gradual disappearance of the crop formations when they it's like they're giving up yeah. on us because we have this demon in our midst in the form of, I don't want to say it, but in the form of the intelligence community. And it, that's what it is. And it, it, I mean, they don't mean to be that. They're just trying to do what they understand is their job. And uh, they're, they're not properly uh, informed. Uh, you know, uh, these people who were with him, coming with him, they were the Nordics. Is that correct? The yes, blonde, they were tall, blonde. Mm -hmm. They weren't the tall whites, which are tall and have very flat faces. I've, I've met, the reason I ask is I've met both kinds. Uh -huh. And um, the Nordic I met was a, wasn't all that tall. And um, he, he was fairly tall. We talked mostly on the phone. I only saw him briefly one, once or twice, very briefly. Uh, and... Uh, he seemed, I mean, he could have easily walked the streets. You wouldn't have thought he was what he was unless you had reason to know for certain, which I did. And uh, uh, I wonder what happened. Why aren't they here? Where are they? They say they can't interfere with our development, that that would involve altering our free will. They can if it affects something that is going to affect the universe, the cosmos around us. And that's why when people talk about we're headed for a nuclear war or something like that, where we would destroy not only the planet, but ourselves, that's when I think they would be able to step in. But, you know, they do. I've had many instances where I've talked to contactees and they talk about these individuals that look very much like us, a few differences maybe, but they're minute where they're really not noticed. And yeah, these people are practical. on the planet. They're walking among us. Yeah. And they're kind of watching us, but they're not interacting terribly much. Well, I've had one experience with one of them, and I was at the farmer's market. All right. And, you, you know, if you see one or two of them, you get to, you can tell pretty quickly there's an energy there yeah yeah so it was a woman and uh she was wearing a a white short white dress and uh at the santa monica farmer's market mm -hmm. and she proceeds to come up behind me and uh hit me with her hip and i looked around and there was this face i recognized what she was immediately and she laughed and turned around and walked away. And I thought, there's something cool about this and, and also kind of sad because why don't 
why did she have to turn around and walk away? Why couldn't she have come over and we could have talked and made a film or video or something? But it mm -hmm. gets back to that non-interference. And I, I have had loads of explanations of that. And I understand it. And it's, in, it's called cultural colonization. Yeah. And what it does is you we would be overwhelmed by their superiority and our entire culture would turn toward them just like what happened when europeans with pots uh, uh metal pots and pans and guns and everything showed up at on uh isolated in isolated places around the world which didn't have all that cool technology uh, yeah. the local people were either overwhelmed by the technology or completely focused on it or both and often it was much to their detriment like in in uh, mexico the when the spaniards showed up 20 years later nine out of 10 people who had been alive in mexico before they showed up were gone it had been depopulated by this and you know, so cultural colonization is a very serious thing. And or in, in New Guinea, it sapped when the U.S. Air Force showed up in during World War II. It, it didn't, uh, they, they didn't do anything to hurt the people, obviously, but their culture was sapped and they began to feel like a kind of joke because they were they, they were praying to these gods that they now thought were childish and foolish and so forth. That would happen to us on a massive scale if these people came. And then there's the issue of conflict, because the guy I talked to was warning me about the greys and saying that, uh, you know, that, that, that you shouldn't in interact with them, that they're dangerous. And, of course, I can't help interacting with them. I don't interact with them. They interact with me. <laughs> I've been now I've had them in my life for years and years. And they're, I would say that I wouldn't, I don't think they're dangerous to me. They're testy and they don't have things like holidays, unfortunately. So, you know, if you're working with them, you're working with them all the time. So anyway, let's, that's all that said. We've got a lot of questions here and um, let me see, I'm on a new computer. So I will, I will fail in a new way here. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get this, uh, to the point where I can, oh good, I can scroll up to read the questions. Can you please explain, oh, this is a simple question. I'm so deli delighted for you, Brett. Uh, can you please explain the spiritual aspect of Pleiadian technology in 15 seconds? Actually, <laughs> in 15 seconds is me. The, <laughs> the, the, forget 15, 15 seconds, seconds. Okay. do your best. <laughs> oh boy <laughs> spiritual technology to them is recognizing that everything literally everything is a part of creation not just the human side of it or the animal flora fauna stuff but everything whatever we have created is an extension of creation they don't have a singular god because they see creation in everything so it's it has that different aspect and that is their spiritual technology so their technology has a sense of spirituality in it they've managed to balance those two concepts for themselves so that it works where spirituality does not outstrip technology technology does not outstrip spirituality everything works together it's literally all related that means to me that the sh technology of the ships is very different from what we think yes. of as technology do you know anything about it well they have told billy that the differences that they have in their physics or what they call our physics are extreme that we have many aspects of physics we haven't even begun to recognize so in that process they have created a technology that is it sounds strange but it's basically based on thought 
And that thought is a pure form of energy that then works with the craft to propel it forward. It's not like they have to turn on an ignition and, you know, push it into drive. They do it through thought. You know, um, there there's a book. Uh, let me think now. Uh, is it by Preston Dennett? I don't think so. Um, uh, called uh, UFO Sky Pilots. And mm -hmm. it's about close encounter witnesses who have flown the UFOs. And every story is the same. They put their hands on a console and their souls sweep out into the craft and become the craft. And I have in my my mind a tiny memory of this. And I, so when I read UFO Sky Pilots, um, I thought to myself, my God, I didn't think anyone else ever had that. I thought that was just my imagination. Now it turns out hundreds of people do. So it wasn't my imagination. And what I can say about it, having had that experience, and as I say, in my case, it's a just a brief, brief memory, just a flicker of a memory. But I do remember it as being absolutely wonderful and a tremendous amount of fun. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the concept of thought and spirit, soul, um, I could see that how they would use thought as something we would better understand in their explanation to Billy. So in other words, if you, and he had not driven a craft, but he did say that when you are on board the craft, it's your energy that's basically guiding it. And that's why they have a scientific term they used that they correlated to our term tachyon propulsion, which was being developed by Dr. John McVeigh in Scotland for a long time. And it was worked on by different astronauts and things like that. Tachyons is where there is no time and no space. So if you have this thought that you're moving from the location of 400 light years away from Earth and you're going to go to Earth and you're going to do it in seven hours, you're there. It's the thought. Well, that was, the, yeah. the, man, the man I talked to said that. He said, it doesn't take any time. Yeah. And I thought to myself, my God, he's saying that he could go from his living room to my living room, 500 light years away in it instantly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I thought, but he doesn't. <laughs> um, okay. I invite him more often. As someone who has walked into, who walked into Billy Mayer's case as a skeptic, can you speak to your experience as you came to realize that his story was legitimate? I've always had a fascination regarding the psychology of people exposed to the phenomenon, both directly and indirectly. Wow. It's like a drop of water hitting a pond. It just ripples out. When you realize you're dealing with something that you can't disprove, you can't debunk, it opens everything to you. It opens an entirely new side of life. I, it's wonderful for me. I mean, it took me into areas in past that I never thought I would explore. But I've learned so much and I feel so appreciative for the fact that that little drop of water just created a flood that has come to my life that has been absolutely wonderful. I uh, don't regret a second of it at all. Uh, what about the photos Billy Meyer claims to be of his ex extraterrestrial contacts, which were really photos of stills from Dean Martin's dance troupe, The Gold Diggers? That's a fun one because Many people say that Billy said that particular photograph that you're one talking about is of Samyasa. It's not. He says it is a cosmonaut from another universe, a uh, parallel universe to ours, and her name was Ascot. We actually put that photograph in the book because that's one of those things you cannot prove or disprove. 
we went through hours and hours and hours of Dean Martin's footage. And we couldn't find that specific scene, that movement, that shot. There were three girls in there that all had long, very blonde hair. But to say, this is that scene and this is how it was taken, we can't do it. So we don't know what it is. And we're not going to, as an investigator, you're going to run into things no matter what the case is, whether it's UFOs or something much more material and normal. You're going to run into things you can't explain. But you don't dismiss everything because you can't explain one thing. And there were actually several things in the Meyer case we couldn't explain, still can't. Big question marks for us. Um, one was the Ascot photograph. There was another that had, Billy had taken a picture, and he was rarely allowed to do this, from the interior of the craft looking out at two other craft. We couldn't authenticate that in any way either. Um, things like there was a report that one of the trees where the craft had hovered right next to it had just vanished. It didn't just vanish. We went and talked to the farmer. He cut the tree down. It started to die. So things like that, when we could get in and really delve into it, then we dug up all the information we could. But when we couldn't, we're left with as many questions as everybody else. And the only one that has the truth is Billy Meyer. Oh, by the way, folks, uh, one of you kindly mentioned that the book I was trying, I was talking about was uh, UFO Sky Pilots by Grant Cameron. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I'm I'm told here that uh, by one of the one of the people that Cosmic that you have some questions that you put in, but they don't show up. So could you put them in again? Uh, they're not. They're they're not. I'm not seeing them. Cosmic has uh, been with us for many years, and she's. Uh, had a stroke and she always pre-types her questions and uh, you might she, you might go up to the top of the meeting chat i i did and i i, Not I there? okay no. um you and i have had some weird problems lately i don't quite get what's going on with leaving <laughs> retrograde i was going to interview do an interview yesterday morning i managed to lock myself out of my office oh my oh, gosh man. Had no key. I could the keys. None of the keys worked. I got a locksmith here, paid a couple hundred dollars, and I said the strange thing is I know this is my office key, and I put it in. It worked. <laughs> okay, here they come. Okay. Okay, we're gonna go to Cosmic's questions now because uh, she always she always starts off the meeting. Um, we call them the Pleiades, the star group, and the beings, the Pleiadians, what do they call themselves? Well, Billy says they call themselves Pleiarans, but when we first met him, he called them Pleiadians because that was a term they told him that Earth people would understand. They are actually from the planet Era. So if we were looking at it technically, we would call them Arans or something similar to that. But they're uh, they're comfortable with the name Pleiaran. They're comfortable with the name Pleiades, Pleiadian. It was said on Dreamland that the Pleiadians originated somewhere in the constellation of Lyra. Right. Is it only a coincidence that in the movie Contact that the communication received from the alien beings originated with, from Vega, a lovely star in the constellation of Lyra? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's any such thing as coincidence, really. Um, I always find that there's a strange synchronicity to things. Even when it's not intentional, it'll show up. So I think that had point and purpose. Yeah, I think uh, Carl Sagan got got netted. Uh, I don't in 1977. I don't think it. I think he was. Um, in a very conflicted situation. Yeah. Uh, does Brit or the Pleiadians know anything about the being or entities that we call orbs? Good question. The Pleiadians have not, to my knowledge, discussed orbs. 
I've had several personal experiences with orbs. I know researchers that have done a lot of work in that area. I find them interesting. I find their energy kind of informative. They do show up. I've had them show up in pictures. I've seen them. I've had uh, individuals that freak out because it's something different when they visually see them. When you see it on film, you have a tendency to say, oh, it's a lens flare, it's dust, it's something. But there's so much more than that. And there's a lot of feeling to them. There was a woman living in New Mexico that was taking pictures of them. And they would, in the orb itself, be showing specific images, like the earth and a specific red spot up in Northern California indicated a forest fire. Different things like that were actually showing up on her film. It was quite interesting. But she was having a lot of telepathic communication with them. Yeah, well, that's another thing that we supposedly don't believe in, telepathic communication. But it's the way you communicate with these all of these people. They don't communicate any other way that I know of. Although the guy I talked to who was one of them, one of the Nordics, talked on the phone and he talked normally. I mean, he's... He was he could talk normally. I I never I'm not aware of ever having a telepathic communication with him. Um, what was the initial re, his initial reaction when Billy realized something out of the ordinary was happening in front of him, especially at that time? Yeah, in in 1975, he was okay with it because as a child he had seen a craft with his father when he was five years old and he looked up he saw this object in the sky ask his dad what is that and his dad said oh that's one of hitler's airships so it was dismissed as that billy had had other experiences as well so he knew that this was not of this earth but he was surprised when they sat down the ship on the, actually landed, Samyasa got out, approached him, introduced herself, and said, we will be talking over the years. That's it's fascinating. Uh, it's interesting to see the Wikipedia entry and other bios on Billy mm -hmm. does not seem neutral, fraud, hoax, allegedly. The wiki author made sure that the, his prophecies repeatedly blamed Jews for future atrocities. I wonder how this clouds legitimacy uh, and attempt to dismiss him. Well, first of all, nothing in this entire field on Wikipedia is presented neutrally. Wikipedia is against this. And uh, listen, you look at my own Wikipedia entry, and we've tried to change it and it's immediately changed back to something false. Mm -hmm. That is very, very true. Um, when you get into the prophecies of Billy and of other contactees as well, I can't really call them prophecies. I call them predictions because they're not always 100%. What happens is the Pleiadians have what they call an event clock. And if event A happens and event B happens, then C is bound to happen. But if A doesn't happen or B doesn't happen, C won't happen. So it's predictions based on kind of an algorithm of what's going on in our world, in our life. I have never run into anything that has flat out said it is the fault of one group or another that these horrible things that others are saying are going to happen to Earth are going to happen. Um, but, you know, like you said, there's so much disinformation out there. And when you try to correct it, it's going to be changed. It's just almost an instantaneous thing. Is it, there's, some, there's someone, and I'm not so sure that this is a, this is originates with us. Mm-hmm does not want us to know the truth and who really uh wants a wants this place to remain in a state of confusion 
-hmm. Because as long as we are confused and don't know what's going on, we're helpless. Yeah. And, you know, that gets me to the, back to the grays in their, their sinister workings. Because, you know, they do things here that I, I, I'm I assuming we would not, not like if we really understood. I mean, I, I had sexual material taken from my body, and a lot of people have had that happen. And it's not something uh, I would I would prefer it not to have happened. Uh, I would have tried to prevent it if I had known it could happen. I would have made an effort to protect myself. I wouldn't have been out in the country alone in the middle of the night, for example. Uh, and I think we all would do that. So uh, let's get to the next question. Um, oh. Uh, oh. Uh, do you believe or have been told that they have been involved in intra-forming Earth for millions of years. I don't know quite what you mean, uh, viewer, by intraforming. You, 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 do you mean uh, uh, yeah. terraforming? Okay, terraforming. In other words, are, are they involved in the evolutionary progress and of, of Earth? No, they say they can't be. They were when they first got here because they intermixed with humans who were living here as did many other groups. Um, but now they say that they can't, that they have learned that lesson, that they cannot be responsible for altering our free will. So we have to be responsible for ourselves. They say we're like kids, little brothers and little sisters, and we have to grow up and learn our own lessons. Well, I, I have a feeling that's going to be a pretty hard lesson to learn. Uh, yeah. We're definitely going down that road. But I, I, the greys don't care. They said, well, it's just population. There's too many of you because you were designed badly. And yeah. what do you mean? I, and I, they, well, no hair, big genitals, no seasonality, and excellent memories made you oversexed and you have had too many children mm -hmm. and uh, and i thought to myself well who designed us and the answer was nothing i've never gotten an answer to that question yeah and the grays are biologic androids aren't they like worker bees well you try them on and you'll soon find that they may they may be that, but they are very, very busy worker bees. And if you work with them, you will be busy too. Mm. Uh, okay, so where are you now with all of this? Now you have kind of returned to this and brought it out again, and are trying to make a make a make a stand. Brent, what is your motivation at this point? I think minds are much more open today than they were when we first brought the books and the documentary film out. I think people want to learn. And I think the more of us that contribute to that knowledge, the better off the population and the planet is. It's kind of a wake up call time for us right now on so many levels, not just what is happening around the earth but what's happening with each other how we treat each other and how we treat ourselves and i think we we need some more kind of shaking and rattling of that core information base we have and i think it's a good time to bring it back out just to let people to have the opportunity everyone has to make their own decision it's up to you what you want to feel into and believe or don't. And that's okay. But you've got to have something there to look at to make the determination whether or not, oh, this could be real or this might not be real. Doesn't matter if it's UFOs or anything else. You have to have the information. So by putting it out now, I think the topic is less taboo than it was in 70s. And I think more people are open and, and curious. Thank God they're getting curious. I read that Billy was told by the Pleiadians that they knew he could handle their visitations because he meditated and had been to India. 
not because he meditated and had been to India, but they did know that Billy would be able to handle it because they had studied him for 10 years before they initiated that contact in 1975. So they knew what he was capable of dealing with and how he would deal with it. And that's why they were comfortable with him. But yes, he did meditate and he did travel through India. He traveled all through the Middle East. He traveled through Pakistan and Europe. He was quite worldly, even though he did not have an education as we think of it. He did have worldly knowledge. He knew how to do things. He could fix things with his hands. He was great that way. And India is a really powerful place. I went there as a tourist in January with no notion of any. Of, I, I had a, of course, I had studied uh, some of the, the Hindu texts and so forth and um, was aware of uh, 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 tantra and real tantra, not not the not the internet tantra. Um, and um, I went as a tourist, and I I did not do any any rituals or anything, but it was just an overwhelmingly powerful experience. It it changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very very extraordinary place, the most difficult place I've ever been in my life, and also the most wow. uh, most wonderful. Does Brit have an awareness of the Nazca lines and the mummies discovered there? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, where do I go with that? Yeah, the mummies are a point of contention for many investigators. I'm very good friends with Jaime Malson. He's doing a lot of the research on it now. He's got DNA out at different labs being analyzed for confirmation. Um the Nazca lines, oh, wow, they are so amazing. And they're, you know, to me, they're just something spectacular. I oh. do feel, having seen them, I do feel that you have to really observe from above in order to feel into the energy that's there. They're just so, so fabulous. But yeah, they're they're great. But yeah, Jaime is working on the mummies, and when he gets that information, I'm sure he'll be letting everybody know. I would think so. Uh, do you have any thoughts on? Well, no, we don't. We don't generally do. Uh, I, I don't like to. It's a. The, I'm not going to ask you to answer the question. Do you have any thoughts on Dolores Cannon, Cannon and her, her research? I don't like for us to talk about other researchers in the show. I never, never bring that up for the simple reason that this community is just so fraught and so full of vindictive sure. stuff. Uh, it's just better. Uh, uh, Can I say one thing, though, Whitley? This is yeah, okay. Yeah, go this right is really important because no matter what my opinion is of Dolores, who I did know very well, um, I respect all researchers as well as all experiencers. Every one of us has something to contribute to the knowledge base we can put together. And that's what makes all of this so wonderful. So whether or not I agree or disagree, that's immaterial. They're presenting something people can learn from. So I, I hold that respect and appreciation for anyone doing the work or who's experienced things and sharing their information. Uh, the uh, viewer adds her content, not her validity. What do you think about Dolores's content? I think that's a perfectly straightforward question. Sure. She had a lot of good content. Um, probably, I would say, more so in the middle years of her work than in the latter years. But I, I thought Dolores did us all a big service by bringing forth much of the information she did, both on Nostradamus and on the extraterrestrial side as well. She had, uh, I mean, what she presented really gives you cause to think a little deeper. And that's what's important to me. Do you have any indication that the Palladians may come back? Yes. Billy said that they will be coming back. 
there are several other contactees out there as well that are saying the Palladians are going to be coming back. And they haven't been gone that long. They're still staying in touch with their contactees, but they're not making themselves seen by others around the world like they had for so many years. Yeah, well, exactly. And uh, there's there's been a... They were in the Denver Boulder area for a long time. That's where I had my interactions with both them and the tall whites. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, they're not there now, as far as I can tell. I was yeah. out the same area where I used to meet, used to encounter them a few weeks ago, and there's no sign of their presence, no feeling of their presence at all. Yeah. So, uh, cosmic. One of the viewers' comments: Malsan has talked to Burchett. Congress is looking at connections to the mummies in Peru, and yeah, that I know a great deal about those mummies. By the way, I've been involved with that for a long time, and they are <laughs> they are really a mystery wrapped in an enigma because, like, some of them even the ones that appear to be fake can't be faked. They can't be done. It's not possible. And yet they do have, it's just the most wonderfully enigmatic thing in the world. And the greatest part of the enigma in many ways is that the um, man who brings the mummies in, Mario, as he's known, is a well-known grave robber who's probably paid off mm -hmm. half in government <laughs> uh and uh you can't go to the cave where he finds them where he gets them right and so there's no provenance and try as i have tried getting a scientific group in the united states uh, you know, like a, a a a group that's capable of of granting uh, or getting grants and publishing papers in the peer-reviewed press to look at something that starts out with its provenance is a grave robber and it's apparently apparent alien bodies, corpses. You're not going to get very far as I right. did not. And yet at the same time, uh, there is something there. They're, they are real, especially the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. The smaller ones, I don't know what the heck they are. We couldn't make them. No. And when you see the x-rays of the bone structure, the bodies, you could see that they weren't just put together piece by piece and created yeah. that way. Um, Jaime's also got some initial reports in from the DNA that, yes, there is human, but there's also other DNA as well. So that, you know, is what sort of sparked Grenada and some of these other places in Europe primarily into looking into the DNA further to determine what it might be. Yeah. Um, the issue with the hands, the fingers, the skull size, the body proportionment, it is beyond anything that uh, we've seen before. And yeah, there's a lot of things that, I hate to say it, grave robbers and different individuals that are not always above board on things they have brought to the public in a way that the knowledge can be learned from and we've got to get science behind these things no matter what the source is and and that's important because we're also finding different things like that pertaining to ufos yes exactly we sure are and, and we can't ignore it. It's not fair. We're going to find out, I think, that DNA is 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 a uh, com is community property. That there you go. <laughs> we have DNA mixed uh, with the grays, with the Palladians, probably mm. all. I mean, everybody has got bits and pieces of each other's DNA because we've all been hanging around each other for a long time. Right. Um, how can people contact you directly? They can reach me through my email, brit at brittelders.com. 
That's the easiest way to reach out to me. I okay. may be slow getting back to you, but I will get back to you. Yeah. That sounds like me. Yeah. <laughs> um, growing up in Mount Shasta, hmm. my friend's dad had Billy's book in 1981. I was 10 years old. I could not wait until I was in, to be invited back so I could look at it. Uh, it's not actually a question. Such fond memories. No, that's sweet. I remember walking past a bookstore. This is when the book first came out. And A, being fascinated, and then B, saying to myself, nah, it's got to be a fake. <laughs> I was not in this space at all then. Little did I know what would happen to me. Um, uh, would Billy over time have physical consequences as a result of these close encounter events? I believe so. I'm not going to say definitively yes or no, <clears throat> but I do believe so. The reason I say that is the first craft that he interacted with had a radiation leak and they had to remove it from service. The uh, fact that we were picking up high levels, I mean, peg the meter levels of gamma radiation in 1982, seven years after his experience, he has to have had some form of physical damage done to it. There was a point in time where he had um, he would stand up, he would black out. People thought maybe it was low blood sugar, things like that. And it wasn't. And I think that had a lot to do with it. Uh, with the, the radiation had a lot to do with what he was experiencing physically. But so many years afterwards, his moped still hot with radiation. His belt buckle still hot. So yes, I'm sure he has suffered some ill effects from it. Um, from the contact itself, no, just from the ship. But he's doing pretty well. He's 87 years old. He's still kicking. He's doing his thing. Well, that's great. I'm, yeah, I I think there's been, uh, I've had a, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My camera is too smart. <laughs> Me. All right, it's gonna bite me. No, there we there we go. I'm back again. It thought you went down the hall. Uh, no, I don't know. I mean, why did it think I went down the hall? <laughs> I, I, I feel like I didn't leave the room. <laughs> Emma thought I did though. No, um, yeah, it's strange. Uh, okay. Uh, um, yeah. I, well, here's a one comment here that um. They had thyroid problems. I know quite a few people in this field and area who've had thyroid problems, and I haven't had any problems. But I, there was a signal in here for years, and I it worried me. It's it turned off in the past few months, but it's it was in here in at one forty four point one megahertz for oh. ten years, and I always thought to myself. You know, I'm nervous around Wi-Fi. Shouldn't I be even more nervous with this signal? Um, okay, I think we have come to the end of our question. So, folks, if you've got another question, put it in there now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> we're just about to say goodbye to Rich. He's got, we, we're just right at the top of the hour. And I promise my guests that we will finish at the top of the hour. Yeah, well, I appreciate this so much. Thank you all for your questions. Well, Britt's book is, of course, available in the unknowncountry.com store and uh, on Amazon or wherever you buy books. And, um, okay, where's the last question? Are the Pleiadians and the Apus of Peru one and the same, Nordics? Very good question. I don't believe so. But I've run into three contactees from Peru and Ecuador that say they're very much the same, but they come from different locations, different locations in the heavens. So I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. I haven't delved into those other contexts like I have the Meyer case. So I can't say for sure. 
Well, thank you very much, Britt. I've really enjoyed it, and I think everybody else. Oh, thank did. you. You guys have been great. Oh, yeah, it has been such fun. And now I'm going to try to succeed in something I almost never succeeded in, which is doing something technological, like turning off the recording. Uh, oh, no, I've got it. I can stop the recording. Okay, folks, uh, get the Pleiadian agenda. Go and get into this. Uh, do it. Uh, it's really worth your time.